Welcome everyone to the Peak Performance Podcasting. We are doing our second podcast with Casey Stutzman, who has been uh, in the training industry since 2004. He has a great website, www.caseystutzman.com. He, his podcast name is Trainer's Toolbox. Uh, he's also on Facebook. He's also is a master trainer for Ignite Performance, which is an Under Armour brand, and Fitness Anywhere, also known as TRX. And that's where I actually met Casey at a, at a TRX certification. I uh, was really impacted by his energy and his passion for functional training and for being open-minded to training. And I'm very happy to uh, have him on our podcast and offer this information to you via iTunes. So uh, did I miss anything there, Casey? No, that was uh, very kind and very thorough. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I, I, I did my homework. Uh, so... The, the big thing that really spurred me to do this podcast with you was when I when I put together this website, Peak Performance Video, I wanted to do something that actually captured many people from different walks of life to talk about some common trends and questions that I've always asked about training or about business or about just people and why they're so successful. So my first question that I want to start off with is when you hear peak performance, what does that mean to you? That means that means a couple things to me. First off, it's building on top of strong foundations. Whenever I think of something that performs well, and, and this is in everything, whether you're, you know, anything, the most time and the most planning and the most care always goes into the foundation. I mean, if you think of a race car, like how much time and design goes into the chassis. If you think of a skyscraper, how much time and energy goes into the foundation. Because if something is going to perform at an incredibly high level or have to deal with lots of stress, we, we know that the foundations have to be strong, that the base has to be there so that it can perform at those levels. And I think sometimes in training, actually I think very often in training, unfortunately, this is that step that we kind of want to skip. We want to go right to the top. You know, we'll spend 15 minutes teaching someone how to squat body weight and then all of a sudden put weight on their back. And And in my opinion, that's, that's going right to those high levels without earning the right to get there. So I'm a huge fan of, of looking at foundations and building, building good core stability and building good movement and building good mechanics. And then once an athlete or a client has, has earned the right to start doing some of the next level progressions and, and adding weight or adding explosiveness or, you know, using different fitness tools, then we'd like to take them up to that, to that higher level. But the second part too, is, is kind of over-preparing for me. I don't think there's such a thing as over-preparation. And a, a quote that I heard one time that Peter Twist said that uh, has always stuck with me is that when the game is on the line, an athlete does not rise to the occasion. They sink to their level of training and preparation. And and what I how I took that is that, you know, we have this fallacy that, you know, your Michael Jordans, your Wayne Gretzky's, when the game's on the line, all of a sudden they have this well of strength that they can tap into and, and rise up and perform at those levels. But that's not true. What is true is that they have trained so hard and so rigorously that when they're tired, when they're fatigued, when, you know, when, when things are challenging, when there's pressure, they're used to dealing in those circumstances, and therefore they still perform at a high level. But because they prepare so well is why they're able to perform so well. So for me, peak performance is a combination. It's, it, it's building strong foundations and then leveraging strong foundations in order to, to get the results that we want to see. But then it's also that, that step of, of, of preparing not only athletes but clients for any and all situations and, and testing them and pushing them physically and mentally so that when they do need to sum up that, that drive, that energy, it, it's nothing new. They've done it before. They know what it feels like. They know how to do it. They've had that practice and that repetition. And, and in a sense, there, there's very little new that happens for them. That's a great answer. You, you talk about peak performance as a as a earning the right and building the blocks to your success uh, in whatever outcome that you decide to apply that to. How did you learn to do the job? Where did you what 
what, where did you grab that, that philosophy and, and who influenced you in that, in, in, in that path? You know, that's, uh, those are both great questions and I, I totally think they go hand in hand. You know, kind of where I learned or picked up some of the stuff that I follow and, and that I like and that has influenced my training and it, it just by surrounding myself with people way smarter than I am. I don't think you can ever go wrong doing that. If you surround yourself with people who are too like-minded or people who think like you, you're never experiencing anything new. And if you never surround yourself with people better than you, then you'll kind of stay in the same space. But, you know, so I, I, I've actively tried to be around people that are way smarter than I am and know a lot more and, and know different stuff than, than I know. And that's, it, it opens your, your, your life and your mind to different ideas that you might never have thought of before. I, I've been very, very fortunate. So I work at Bay Athletic Club in Alpena, Michigan, small town, and my, my boss there, his name is Trina Gray, she's the owner of the facility, and she would be one of my first major influencers just because I had never had a, a, a boss or a leader before who had really focused on trying to help people develop personally and, and giving them the tools to do so. And not everything we did always related to, to the club or related to fitness, but she was big on helping people grow and putting them in the right direction and showing them tools and of course, she did a really good job of it herself, and she's an incredibly successful business owner. So seeing that there was you know, all these different lessons that could be learned from different authors and, and, and you know, podcast hosts and, and all these different people and, and how we can take and apply these into fitness and the fitness industry and growth and development and education, that was a huge eye-opener and a big lesson for me. Another big one would be Fraser Quelch, who is uh, the director of education at TRX. And I've had, you know, a wonderful and long-standing relationship with Fraser. He's the one who brought me on board to the TRX family um, about three years ago now. And, I, you know, I'll be forever forever grateful for, to him for, uh, for taking the chance on me because I really didn't have any experience presenting. He just, you know, again, kind of took a chance. And, uh, and, and he's been so, so, so important and that, you know, helped me develop not only as a coach, but a presenter and just shown me so many other great ideas. And then through him, I've met so many other amazing people, you know, through the TRX family and then outside of there as well that have just opened my eyes to different things and, and just different ways of looking at things or, or made me rethink how I was doing something or how I was looking at something. And then the last and the most recent would actually be Peter Twist. And originally, pretty indirectly, it's kind of funny. When I first started with Combine 360, and this is, it'll be three years this fall, so not quite three years yet, Combine 360 was uh, partnered with Under Armour. And since then, um, they've kind of devolved, dissolved that partnership, and Combine 360 was purchased by IMG Academy and turned into Ignite 360 Performance Training. And when that was kind of happening at the same time, Peter Twist became the major educational and program development partner for Ignite 360. And now he was involved with Combine 360, but he took a really big role when we switched over. So him and his team have been uh, really, really important in developing a lot of the curriculum and a lot of the methods that stand behind the, the Ignite 360 training methodology and philosophy. And that training and that style and the education that I got to experience through Ignite 360 and, and back when it was Combine 360 as well, like totally changed the way that I looked at training clients and athletes and programming and, again, just introduced me to a whole different population of people way smarter than me and a whole lot of different ideas and a lot of the great coaches down at IMG Academy where they train world-class athletes. So. I think those three people have been really key and influential, and there's so many more, but if I think about, you know, who are the relationships that help open the doors for some of those others, I think those three would be the biggest one. But, uh, yeah, in the end, it, it was just being around good people and, and, and listening to what they had to say, because that, you know, sometimes we hear something that's different than something we know or we think we know, and we instantly kind of shut the door to it instead of approaching it and just saying, okay, hey, that, that sounds interesting. Let's, let's, let's explore that a little bit. And whenever I hear a new idea from these people or anything else or something that may be different than something I've known, there's nothing wrong with exploring. And, and I've never been led astray 
by following an idea that piqued my interest, or even following something that maybe didn't make sense to me at the time. Or if I hear something that's contradictory to something I currently believe, you better believe that's something that I'm going to check out because I either want to, you know, be able to speak to it. Okay, why is that incorrect? And and that's going to help to strengthen the foundations of my, my beliefs. Or maybe my beliefs are wrong, and I, I'm going to find a, a better path. But either way, you know, when something comes up that's either different or, or just sounds interesting, you know, being willing to, to go after it and explore it and, and, and not being tied down to what you currently believe because pretty much everything we know is wrong. We just use the best model we have at the time. You know, it, it's really interesting, you know. I've had these conversations with many different people, and uh, the common thing that you're repeating that I keep hearing is you're a life learner and that you're going to continuously ask questions. Uh, I think that's the, uh, the, the ideal uh, representation of what we're trying to communicate, how you can achieve to be better, and, I, and that striving to be better uh, usually leads you in, uh, to meet people, but it also uh, allows you to have access maybe to information. That being said, w what books have, have molded you in, in your influence uh, to your success? i got to be honest, out of all the questions, this is the one I had to think about the most. <laughs> and, and it's Don't because... Don't say Batman now. Do what? <laughs> Don't say Batman now. I know you're... I know, you're I, know. I, I know. I know. I had to take those ones off the list right away. Um, but, yeah, because I knew they weren't, weren't appropriate for this setting. But, uh, yeah, they're up there. <laughs> um, um, you know, and, and the reason I had to think so much about this question was because if I were to pinpoint one behavior that has really, really changed the trajectory of my life and my career, it was reading. And it was something I never, ever, ever did before. I somehow made it through high school only reading like two or three books. I didn't read anything during college. I didn't read after that. I just, I never really read. It was not something that was interesting to me. And then it was about three, three years ago. And I, I can't even remember what sparked it. I, you know what? I do remember. It's when I started working with TRX and I started traveling more. And I needed something to do on the plane when you couldn't have your electronic devices turned on. Because it was the first time in my life I'd really started traveling. And so I guess I'm like, all right, I, I guess I can read. <laughs> and so I had a book that had been sitting there for a long time. I've always been a huge Michigan fan, years on football. And I had Bo's Lasting Lessons. And it was a, a great book written by, uh, I think, John Bacon and, um, and, and Bo Schembechler before he passed away about his lessons in leadership. And I had been meaning to read it for a long time. And, and it was just the right opportunity. And I, I got so much out of that book and enjoyed it so much. It just kind of sparked something. And then right around that time, I remember Todd Durkin saying, great leaders are great readers. And it just stuck and it just resonated. And so I set a goal after that point to read a book a month. And, and I'm not a fast reader. I'm not a speed reader. And sometimes I like to dive into some heavy stuff. But you know, for three years, I've been able to keep on the book a month goal and sometimes a little bit more, um, usually averaging about like, you know, 15 to, to 16 books a year. So a little bit above the goal, which is awesome. And it's a comfortable place for me to sit. But so I, I've made a point to try and read a lot in, in the last few years. So picking one book or a couple books is really, really hard. So what I, I did is I just kind of went back to like, which ones do I think about all the time? Or, or which ones really changed my thinking in a way that, has helped so many other different areas. So not just the ones that gave me good nuggets of knowledge, but which ones opened my eyes to, to different ways of living or ways of thinking. And um, from, from uh, either a business or a personal standpoint, there was three that came to mind. And it was uh, Simon Sinek, Start With Why. You know, that, it's an amazing book, and I can't do it justice by just giving a quick once over of it, but his whole basic philosophy is people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And that purpose and why-driven businesses and, and people will always be the most successful and rewarded for, for their, their their mission. And that I am a how person to my core. I am a left brain, linear, detailed person. So realizing that how is not the important thing, but why is was a huge revelation for me. Um, so that, that was a huge one. And just a great book. He's an amazing, amazing writer. Anything Simon Sinek, uh, I, uh, I'm sorry, um, Seth Godin, anything Seth Godin I've been a huge fan of. I read Lynchpin a few years ago, and that was another big deal. That was a game changer for me. The whole purpose of Lynchpin was that 
you know, we have this mindset of the factory worker, right? Like you, you get the factory job, you keep your head down, you don't ask questions, and you're safe. You're taken care of. You get the good job and don't make waves, and, and you're okay. And we live in a time now that safe isn't safe anymore. And if you're a replaceable cog in the machine and there's, if there's a thousand other people just like you saying the exact same thing, not only are you white noise and you get drowned out, but you're replaceable. And it's challenging and scary to be a linchpin, someone that would be missed, someone that's different, but that's truly safe now. So to stand up and to be someone special and to bring something special to the table and be someone different is, is incredibly sought after in our society. And again, that was another big thing for me. I think, you know, our education system, without downing it too much, but it kind of teaches people how to don't ask questions and fall in line. And, and I think success is the exact opposite, is ask questions and stand out. Um, you know, for the third book, uh, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to say fourth. Uh, so Outliers was by Malcolm Gladwell. And it just, it's an amazing book. You have to absolutely read it. It's got some amazing stories in it. I can't do them justice right now. But that book taught me that things are not what they seem. There's always something else going on, and there's always more to the story. And, and always looking for those, those little things, those connections that, that aren't always obvious. I think great leaders are people who make improbable connections. I think creativity is making improbable connections, seeing two things that go together that not everybody else can see. And, and that book for me was, was one of those eye-openers. My, my fourth one that I'm going to sneak in there was The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And for me, especially being a very left brain kind of linear person, it really kind of helped say, okay, here's the path. Like, it was very actionable. When I think about these other books, they were mindset. They were more changing my thinking. But when it came to Seven Habits, that's an actual actionable book where it's, okay, now do this in order to get these results. And that was really, really helpful for me. Sometimes, it, you know, I, I do good following the path, but sometimes it's hard for me to kind of decipher it, uh, to, depending on what it is. From, from a trainer standpoint, I think Athletic Body and Balance by Great Book should be required reading for any new personal trainer. I read it a little bit later in my career, and I wish I would have read it sooner. It would have just saved me a whole lot of screwing up. Uh, over the years. It was really easy to digest, beautifully written, simple, not overly complex, and just had so many great lessons on, you know, in my opinion, the best ways to help train and develop uh, not only just performance, but for, for anybody. And again, I would have saved a lot of mistakes and probably kept a lot of clients um, that I lost because I, I was doing something wrong on the years. And then the final one would be Anatomy Trains. And that's by Thomas Myers. And that book is a little more textbooky. It's a little harder to digest. It's not the easiest read, but totally changed the way I looked at human movement and performance in a very positive light. And it's still a book I reference very often. Ever anybody is asking, you know, how do I understand more about movement and mechanics? I think that is just a huge starting point. Not, not the end-all, be-all. There's so much else that goes into it, and there's lots of other great books, but just you know, looking at the body from a different angle that I had never looked at or been taught before was so helpful in, into becoming a more effective trainer and coach. Oh, you've uh, shared some great books there. My, my personal favorite out, out of everything that you just shared was, uh, was Lynchpin. Um, I, I read it in great book. Can't, uh, I agree with you. I haven't read Outliers, so that's something I'm going to put on my list. You're taking a step back now. We kind of see the frame of, uh, of your philosophy and your influence and where you've been. Do you work out? How do you work out? What are the methods you use? Do you, do you use any type of technology in your workouts, but then also in your job? So I know I asked you four questions, but... No, that's so okay. I, they go together well. They flow well. well. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, first and foremost, absolutely. I, I think that uh, the number one thing <clears throat> that a fitness professional needs to be successful is authenticity. I, I think people can see right through someone who's not authentic. So, I mean, if you're going to help others, you got to live it. <laughs> and so, yes, absolutely. I, I enjoy working out. I enjoy training. I had since I first caught the bug um, back when I was in high school and I was getting ready for college football. Um, but my training has changed a lot during the years, and it's been kind of funny because I think, like with a lot of fit pros, my training has evolved as my education has evolved. So, 
when I first got into training, I was very into bodybuilding and, you know, Schwarzenegger and the whole nine yards. And actually, after college football, I competed as an amateur bodybuilder for about four years in a row, just doing one show a year, amateur shows, no big deal. I did that for about four years. So, I mean, training was kind of my life. It was, it was, it was a job. And obviously, I did more of that bodybuilding style workout, you know, legs on, on, on Monday and, and going through the split routines and lots of isolated movements and, and things like that. And I was experiencing lots of creaks and aches and pains and injuries and and also would notice that when I went to, you know, play football or basketball with my friends, like I was not performing at a very high level. I wasn't crazy fast or quick or powerful by any means. You know, I, I was an athlete growing up and, and still considered myself an athlete, but I was not stellar by any means, and I didn't. I felt like as much working out as I was doing, sometimes up to three workouts a day, that I should probably be better, and I was not not understanding that. But, you know, bodybuilding is just for look. It's all for show. Oh, it doesn't have to perform. As I got done with bodybuilding, I had my first child was on the way, and I just didn't want to do it anymore, especially with an infant around the house, and I was just kind of done. So I was looking for something else, and I was looking for something different. And I was sick to death of my workouts and, and my training. And uh, that's kind of when I started to find things like the TRX, and, and which kind of opened the door to, you know, more quote-unquote functional methods of training. I found the BOSU Balance Trainer, kind of fell in love with that. So I found a couple key pieces of equipment that I really, really fell in love with. And as I continued to explore how to use them and uh, different exercises, it kind of opened the door for more of, you know, this different style and way of training. So that's, I've been hooked ever since. And, you know, the, the methods change and the exercises change, but I, I, I find that uh, as I move through the years, I can't go wrong going back to foundations, as I talked about earlier. So when I look at, like, what methods I use to not only train myself personally, but my clients and my athletes, is, okay, what does the body need to thrive? And, and I think first and foremost, it needs balance. Okay, so balance between what? And then we start looking at different things. Well, I need balance between energy systems. I need to have, <clears throat> you know, training all three muscle fibers. I need to be able to go hard for 10 seconds, but then be able to go long for 60 seconds and at different rest ratios. And I have to be able to move in, in three dimensions and in three planes of motion. So i got to make sure that I'm training front, frontal plane and sagittal and transverse and lateral movement and, and frontal plane stability as well as sagittal plane stability and then power and strength and explosiveness and just looking at all these different, you know, the primary and the secondary characteristics of fitness and then incorporating them into the workouts and the training training protocol throughout the course of the week, the month, the year. But uh, so really, I mean, kind of simple answer to a pretty complex question is both for me and my clients, it's all about balance. It's all about looking at what does the human body need to be able to do to thrive in not only the real world, but in the performance world, and then how can I bring as much balance as possible to that? How can I give them what they need? And, and sometimes it's give them what they're not getting. Like an example, like, uh, okay, here's a personal example. This last weekend, me and a group did our first Tough Mudder, and then this weekend I have a, uh, an Olympic distance triathlon coming up. And, you know, I play football, and I'm more of a power sports guy, so just kind of playing with some endurance athletics and enjoying it and having fun with it, but so if I'm swimming and running and biking long distances throughout the course of each week, I want to make sure that I'm not doing all that stuff in my training. Uh, I want to make sure that I'm keeping balance in the body. So if I'm doing lots of endurance work outside, then I want to make sure that inside I'm maybe doing some more power or strength work or high demand uh, core stability work or some more balance work or I'm changing up the, the work to rest ratios moving in multiple directions, making sure that I'm still getting good rotational movements, good lateral movements, because I'm moving very linear when I'm outside. So just trying to maintain that balance between training and activity or, or just within the training. And I've noticed I, it, it works great for me. <laughs> it works great for my clients. You know, the whole goal, I believe, of fitness and performance is to develop not only a body that works, but a body that allows people to do whatever they want to do. So... For me, I, I'm really happy where I am right now because I decided a few months ago, I'm like, I think I want to do a triathlon, and I was able to do it, whereas I couldn't have done that when I was bodybuilding because my body did not work. 
Um, I didn't have enough balance in my training where I could just decide to try something and then train for it and do it. I would have had to take a lot longer just to get ready to train for it because I was so out of balance. As far as technology goes, generally I'm a little bit more simplistic. I, I guess you could say there's, I know there's lots of fitness toys and, and things out there. Um, I love equipment, but I love simple equipment. I use kettlebells and med balls, I mean, resistance bands, the TRX suspension trainer, the rib trainer, the Dulce balance trainer, the cones, hurdles, outdoor stuff. Like These are all my favorite things to train with and work with. You know, we use lots of other equipment too, but those are some of my favorites. Just they're simple and they're incredibly effective, and there's so much that I can do with them. So I love a lot of those simple functional fitness tools. And from the technology standpoint, I think that pretty much everything a trainer needs is either in an iPhone or an iPad. I absolutely love both. I have both, and and you know they're they're great when you're traveling. But it, it, it's really it's all the stuff you need. Like so, some of the things that I use most in both of these is I love that they can record and capture great pictures and great video. I can edit pictures and video right on both the devices, and then I can post them directly onto YouTube. So. A lot of the content I do for my website and my blog is done entirely with those because it's simple, it's easy, effective, and it helps me get stuff out without having to spend too much time in pre- or post-production. You know, also from, from that angle of the pictures and the videos, like being able to post stuff on Facebook. Uh, we had a Tough Mudder training program that we just finished up a couple weeks ago, so it was really cool to take these guys to unique locations and, and do some cool, fun workouts and film and do pictures and then post them on Facebook later. And they loved sharing them with their friends and, and everything else. So it's a great way to, you know, connect with people. And I think that's what training is all about is, is, is connection and sharing. And I think social media and networks give you that opportunity to do that outside the gym and really connect with people. And you get to see a window into their life and they get to see a window into your life and you get to share stuff and communicate. And I think that helps make us better trainers. And I think things like the iPad and the iPhone allow us to do that very easily and very effectively. There are a couple apps that I use specifically for, for workout stuff. There's, uh, there's a couple like cycling apps that I think are pretty cool. There's like Map My Ride and um, Starva or Shiva? I can't remember um, what the name of it is. But someone just turned it on me to do it. So, but it's, it's kind of cool. And so I use those as like, you know, like the computer on my bike when, when I'm out for longer rides. Timer, seconds. And Seconds Pro is a great app because it's all these different customizable timers that you can use. I use those on my iPad especially because it's uh, got the nice big screen. And during workouts, that is so awesome to have, to be able to set up all that stuff and not be forgetting intervals or watching my watch all the time and be able to focus on people when they're, when they're out there. And then um, lastly, there's an app called Coach's Eye. And I love this one because you can film people doing stuff and then you can do breakdowns of the film. And you can draw on it and make lines, circles, and slow it down and speed it up, slow-mo and pause. It's really, really cool. So it's like a, a film study tool that you can use for, for people. And you can record your analysis and your voice talking about the analysis. And you can instantly share it with people. So if you have an athlete you're working with or if you want to share something with their parents, it's a super easy way to do that or, or show how they're improving. Um, I use it on my website. Uh, in my blog sometimes to break down either, you know, coaching cues for certain things. Like I think the one I did last week was on a box jump. So using the app to look at, okay, what should we look at in a good box jump? How do we coach it? How do we cue it? And what are some of the key points in there? So from a technology standpoint, I think uh, so those are my go-tos. It's pretty much iPad, iPhone, and then all the great tools that you can get with those. That's pretty cool. Uh, I, I've used Coach's Eye. Um, it's a great product. Uh, it's, uh, I definitely believe biofeedback or neural feedback is, is the future. And yeah, you're starting to see phones and, and iPads and you know, uh, different types of technology out there really just cause a, a, a lot of good information uh, when applied properly. And it, it's definitely the, the, the ongoing uh, method of, 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 of training when we're starting to see that more and more. Um, as, as a master trainer, you've, you've probably uh, have gotten this in, 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 in the classes you've delivered, and people always ask, you know, where's, where, where's the research on this? Um, do, do, you, uh, do you do any type of research uh, practically? Do you do when you use the technology? Do you uh, – how do you, you – know, I, I know some practitioners will actually grab uh, – 
practical data and show that back to their client. Obviously, video is a great way to do it. Do you do or do you have any other research that you would usually cite when uh, when you're doing any type of an event? No, that's a great question. Um, but from the research standpoint, that, that I use that a little bit more for myself. I'll look at research and studies and things like that. But I got to be honest with you, that's not usually my driving thing. I uh, like if I come across something that's very interesting from from a research or a study, then you know it'll cause me to want to dive into it a little bit more, understand it a little bit better. I do like to try and follow stuff that has some research backing or behind it. But on the same token new and cutting edge ideas or things that, you know, like I said earlier, right, everything we know is wrong. We're just using the best model that we have right now. So if I only relied on research, that might make me miss some things. Does that make sense? Um, it, it does make sense. You know, sense. I, I, I got it like... You're, you're talking uh, basically an evidence-based approach. That's what you're really right. looking at. Research is right. just one, one leg of it. And I totally agree. And, and don't get me wrong. Like, I think research is incredibly important, and we want the research to back up what our, our theories and hypotheses are. But so generally, you know, when I'm looking at something or when I'm, I'm traveling down a new road, it's, I, I take that with, okay, here's what I, what I know, or here's what I think I know. And based on what I know or I think I know, this either makes sense or it doesn't make sense. And, and sometimes both are good reasons to continue to further pursue it. Um, maybe it doesn't make sense in a way that it's just, okay, this is not for me. I'm not going to go that direction, or, or that's just not my cup of tea. But maybe maybe it's, okay, wait a minute. That, that doesn't make sense because I've been told this. But, okay, both seem like they could be right, so which is it? And, and then that's a great reason to continue to, to travel down a path and look into something a little bit more. Or it just if an idea comes across, and if it either makes sense to you or it resonates with you or if it just piques your interest, well, okay, let's explore. Let's, let's travel down that road and see where it leads and, and let's see where, what's going on with that. I think being able to constantly learn and, and, and do research within ourselves is super, super easy to do because there's so much information out there. There's amazing blogs, there's videos, there's podcasts, there's books, there's text, there's classes, there's seminars. I mean, if you just, you know, hook up with someone or, or something or a medium and just, you know, if something, if something catches you, just follow it. You can never go wrong. You can never, ever, ever go wrong. Because even if it doesn't lead you to a new exciting place or even if it's something that you decide is, is, is untrue or, or not something that you want to base your training your ideas on or you don't agree with the idea, whatever it is, it's going to come up in conversations. You want to be able to speak to it, or, or it's going to strengthen what you already knew. You can't go wrong with following ideas. You just can't. And I, I truly believe that. And I think when we get into that mindset of, you know, I don't want to spend the time, or what if it doesn't pan out, that's when we start deciding what's worth investigating and what's, what, what's not. And I think most things that are new are, are worth investigating. And I think that's, that's a great way to approach it. And then you know, the, the, kind of the trial and error that I like to do is uh, pick up something new or come across something or a different idea. Like, I usually experiment or guinea pig it on myself first. And does that feel right? Is that good? Does it feel worse? Better? What am I seeing in my training? And, and, and can I apply it? Does it make sense? And so I'll use it on myself first. And then that also helps me be able to coach it and cue it and, and, and realize common faults and all these other things. And and then I'll slowly just kind of start working it into workouts and clients and just seeing, you know, what, hey, I mean, does this work? And is this going to give me the results I want? And is that a good cue or is, is, is that something that maybe is, people aren't going to get or, or whatever it is? So it just sometimes you just got to throw it out there and, and, you know, roll it up to the cycle and see who salutes it. But uh, there's, there's, there's nothing wrong with just, with constantly following different paths of thinking and, and new ideas. You can't go wrong with that. I think it is important to have research to back up certain things. And I think it's also exciting to explore different things. So, like, I'll give you an example. Uh, a couple months ago, uh, a couple trainers that are incredibly smart cats, uh, they're also physical therapists, I mean, like, really, really, really smart guys, uh, are involved with a company called Rock Tape. And I know, I know nothing. 
about like kinesio taping and, and, and all that stuff. But some people that I really respect and I know they know their stuff are involved with this company and some of their presenters. And I had heard a couple of things through their Facebook channels and just enough to kind of pique interest. And then I've had a couple other conversations with people and and they were telling me some of the things that they're looking at, some of the benefits they could see off, off this taping and some of the things that they're potentially seeing and they're starting to do early studies. So like right now there's no data out because they're either setting up studies or they're in the middle of them. But there's a lot of really interesting stuff and a lot of stuff that made sense to me. So it is definitely an area that I want to continue to pursue. And and if it, you know, proves not to be as, as valuable as I thought, then oh well, so be it. I'm sure there's going to be some great lessons that I learn along the way that I wouldn't have otherwise. That's a great example. The the, the other example I think is also I would throw in there is uh is self myofascial releasing. Uh, it, 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 we knew what massage therapy could do, but I think now the styrofoam rollers and the tiger tails and all the other uh, types of tools out there for that type of soft tissue work for self-healing uh, is now, uh, I think the, the, the practical has been, I think, ahead of it. And, and I think now the research is starting to prove certain things and starting to say, hey, this is of value. And that, that would be another example I would throw in there as well. Um, you know, I, I'm down to my last couple of questions, and then I'm going to leave it open to, to, to maybe see what else you want to talk about. I have some other questions, too, that are not on the list. Uh, well, one is, you know, how do you relax? Because I know that you travel a lot. I know that you're doing... You know, you're training, you're full time, you know, so you're doing your one on one and at the same time you gotta jump on a plane and go work with a fitness facility in different areas. Um, how do you what do you do to unwind? Yeah, you know, that's a great question, uh, because I think the pendulum has to swing both ways. I think we can't always be go, go, go. And I have that mindset. It's very easy for me to be go, go, go and like business focused all the time and um, it is really so important again to have balance. And, and balance between between everything, not just between the body, but within all areas of life. And so I have to really prioritize my enjoyable and relaxing time because otherwise I miss it. And it just, you know, I'll blink and all a summer's gone or a fall's gone or, or a year's gone. You know, traveling, actually, I love to travel. I absolutely love to travel. I love everything about it. I love airports. I, I, I just love to travel. And even, you know, I do a lot of traveling by myself, of course, and, and, and I like that too. I love the opportunity to explore new and different areas. So travel for me is not very stressful because it's enjoyable. Now, yes, I've had some very stressful trips, and uh, those happen you know, more than I'd like them to, but if I have even a little bit of time to enjoy whatever city or town I'm in, it, it makes the whole thing worth it. And I have a rule, no chain restaurants, especially when traveling. So it forces me to experience something cool and something different and something local uh, that I can't get here in, in my hometown of Alpena. So I really, really do love to travel. Um, my wife and I are both big movie people. I love movies. I'm a huge movie nerd. And uh, I, 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 there's, there's, there's nothing better than just kind of unplugging and unwinding and turning off and putting on a really good flick and letting it take you someplace special. And I love great movies, and I I like I like watching new ones and taking a chance and exploring. But I also have those favorites that I constantly fall back on. I just be in the mood to watch something awesome, and something will just will just pique my interest and, and sit there. So I, I love most, all genres. Um, comedy and drama and action and horror, anywhere in between. It's, it's rare to find, you know, a, a movie I don't like. Well, actually, I take that back. There's lots of movies I don't like, but there's probably a lot more than I do. And then I think the final one would just be anything outdoors. We live in an amazing area in, in Alpena, Michigan. We're right on beautiful Lake Huron. We also have three very large inland lakes within a 30-minute drive of my house, not to mention uh, – Thunder Bay River, which is this huge river system that comes in off Lake Huron that we can access uh, right through town at, at, at numerous points. So anything outside, just going to the beach, kayaking, uh, riding my bike, riding my mountain bike, running, you know, canoeing, cross-country skiing, snowshoeing, like anything, hunting, fishing, um, anything we get to do outside where you're just enjoying being outside or enjoying activity. Um, and, and that's kind of funny, like, my unwind stuff is usually not like relaxed stuff. 
if I'm outside, I, I, I really enjoy doing something. You know, like I said, out on some sort of human propelled <laughs> vehicle. Or um, I, I think if I am going to be just doing nothing outside or relaxing, it's mainly during hunting season where you're just kind of sitting in just, and relaxing and just enjoying the silence and enjoying the sounds of, of being outside and sitting in a tree when it's 32 degrees and windy in, in <laughs> Michigan. But I love it, and it's perfect, and uh, it, it, it's great. It's great. One last thing, and then I have one question uh, more to ask you, is, is you, you, if you, you know, if you had an opportunity to uh, address someone that's listening on the call that might be just starting out in the industry and wants to follow the path uh, of uh, being, uh, you know, successful at, at, at doing what you're doing, an educator, a full-time trainer, what would be, what would be your um, recommendations on how to do that? That is a great question. I think that's a really simple one because I can look back at when I was a trainer starting off in the industry and what would I have told myself, you know, what is going to help you. And I think it's three things. I think it's a couple of them we talked about earlier is, uh, you know, surround yourself with great people and be around people that are better and smarter than you and don't, you know, don't let it bruise your ego. And, and I know especially as an athlete and a male athlete, you know, that was tougher for me when I was younger was when you're around people smarter than you, you tend to feel stupid or that, you you know, you're behind and, and you are behind, like you're brand new. There's nothing wrong with being around people who know more than you. And, in fact, a lot of times they're very willing to share it. They're not there to rub it in your face. And I think, but the misconception is that we have is that, you know, they're all, they're just going to rub it in my face or they're looking down at me. And that's not the case at all. So as much as possible, be around people way smarter than yourself. Read, read, and, and read some more. Set a goal, grab some books. Like, you don't care. Like, I was not a reader. And it doesn't matter. You don't have to be a reader. But there's so much amazing information from some of the best and the brightest people in the entire world. And it's right at your fingertips whenever you want it. And I think about if I would have started, you know, my, my reading goal seven years ago, like how much different the trajectory of my career could have been or how much more I could know at this point or what other things could if I could have, you know, discovered or what different path I'd be on. And I'm not saying that in a regretful way. I just look back and just think, man, you know, I could know so much more right now than I do if I would have been willing to put in the time to read at that point. I, I think the final thing is just, like, be humble, be hungry. You know, just always be trying to, 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 to move forward. Like, what what can you do different today? Where where can you learn? Where can you grow? And I, I think a big part of that being humble, being hungry, is knowing that you don't know everything. And that when I was first starting off in the fitness industry, like, I knew it all. And not in that cocky, egotistical way, but it was just like I, I, was, I viewed myself as an expert, and I had no idea how little I actually knew. And I don't, I don't say that to, to put people down, and I don't want, you know, new fitness professionals coming into the industry, you know, thinking that they don't know anything because, you know, they know enough to get started. And it's really more about passion to get started, but you know, just getting out of the mindset that, 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 that we know it all, like, or that, that we know enough, because that's never true. You can never know enough. And, man, I look back at how I trained people and how I trained myself, you know, years and years and years ago when I first got started, and I'm just like, oh, my God, <laughs> what was I thinking? And I just didn't know any better, but I didn't have enough humility at the time to, to realize that I didn't know enough. And, and the more that I was willing to ask questions, and again, just be humble, be hungry. Be humble that you don't know everything, and, and, and be hungry for new information. It, it will just take you amazing places. That's, that's a great response. Um, to really, uh, it, I have a couple of things to, 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 to ask you. One is would you be willing to come back on again and talk about maybe program design? Um, I, I think that it would be interesting to hear, because you've mentioned some really interesting methods and applications as far as functional training goes, just, you know, you've done very good jobs at putting together whiteboard video clips for you iTunes people. Definitely want to hear and go and catch those whiteboard clips that, uh, you know, Coach Casey's put together. I think it's awesome. Uh, I I've often have uh, politely um, 
stolen uh, some of the uh, workout schemes. <laughs> That's uh, what they're there for. <laughs> and uh, the last thing is, um, is there any upcoming events that you want to share with the group here uh, for uh, the year that you might be uh, so, going to? Yeah, first, first question is absolutely. I would be honored to be back on. Um, I, I really appreciate the invite, and I was so honored uh, to, to be invited as one of your, your early guests on the podcast. So I, I really, really thank you for that. This has been a wonderful, wonderful conversation. As far as big stuff coming up for this year, there, there, there is, in fact, a very big thing coming up. Um, I, am, I am beyond excited. Um, uh, about six months ago, I started working with a small team of, of fitness professionals um, in conjunction with Headstrom Fitness, who is the company that brings, uh, brings us the Bosu Balance Trainer. And I got to meet one of their VPs named Chris Dye at uh, a then Combine 360 uh, certification uh, that I was presenting at. And he told me about this, this new product that they were developing and coming to market and asked if it was something I'd be interested to get involved with. And I said, absolutely. And so it's been a wonderful, wonderful road over the last six months. And I've been working with uh, Peter Twist and Jay Dawes in order to help develop the, you know, the the, the manual and the programming and the exercise progressions and the overload variables for, for this really, really, really cool piece of equipment. And we have our big launch at Ideal World this August. So I'm beyond excited with that. I get to share the stage with Pete Twist and, and present the first ever Surge. Um, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't give the name. It's called the Surge. Um, and, and we get to stand up there and, and share this with the world for the first time. So it's a big unveiling. It's a big launching. I am super, super excited about this, this whole thing. It's really cool to see it, you know, finally come and the, the culmination. And our session is at, uh, I can't remember the number off the top of my head, it's at 1020 on Friday morning. And that is uh, the 11th, I believe, of August. It's uh, the, the, the Friday during the Ideal World. So very, very excited about that. Where is Ideal World this year? It is in L.A., at the L.A. Convention Center. Oh, wow, that's nice. Well, uh, if, if I'm going to be in the neck of the woods, I definitely will stop by. I'd love to. I would actually love to video some of it. Um, well, I want to thank you for, for taking the time out of your busy day. 